Now, my great pleasure to welcome up to the stage Jorn Weisbrot, who is the artistic director for Luminato. Now, how many people here in the room have participated in Luminato in some way? Throw your hands in the air so you're all already experts. A very important uh, conversation about the modern metropolis, art and culture in the city. Please join me in welcoming Jorn to the stage. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I've been a nerd, and I wrote out all my uh, manuscript, so um, here we go. A recent expedition into the caves of Chauvet revealed that artists emerged from the earliest human beings and communities about 35,000 years ago, and many years earlier than science so far have thought that the arts existed. Actually, research shows that larger human communities seem to have developed at the same time as these paintings in the caves of Chauvet in the south of France were made, suggesting that through the arts, communities were only able to form, as maybe the arts offer a common spiritual platform and way of interpreting the world that make communi com communal living possible. During those days, we shared the world stage with other homo sapiens, such as the Cro-Magnon and the Neanderthals. None of them seemed to show an interest in the arts. One might ask at this point the question, what is a work of art, or what was a work of art in, that, in those days? I would say that a work of art is a man-made object occupying time or space that has no inherent value to the immediate survival or physical well-being of the individual, such as weapons, pots, wheels, would have. In terms of all other things that seem to differentiate us from animals, such as building fires, cooking our food, clothing ourselves, and using technologies, all the human species during the Pleistocene um, seem to have been all the same. None of them survived. None of them except for us painted or made music. Since Jane Goodall, we know today that animals also use tools, which was long believed to be the differentiator between us and animals, but chimpanzees use little sticks to trick animals out of holes and into their mouth. And yes, we have seen them paint, but we have not seen groups being formed appreciating these paintings, so it is unlikely that these acts of painting were anything but random acts. Animals have consciousness, though. They can even recognize themselves in a mirror. Kathy, the female main star in the 60s TV series of Flipper, could distinguish herself on the screen from her other female substars, Susie, Patty, and Squirt, and also the male dolphin, Scotty, who was brought in to do the standing on its tail dance that females just cannot perform. What would Pamela Anderson have said if she had been substituted by Amanda Lepore for certain stunts in Baywatch, I wonder? Kathy, by the way, committed suicide by stopping breathing. Dolphins breathe consciously, we don't. The idea embodied in the story of Narcissus who fell in love with his own reflection in a pool of water, that consciousness is a purely human achievement, is of course no longer valid. The cave paintings in Chauvet are said to have ritualistic meaning. Neurologists have suggested that movement creates consciousness, implying that all creatures that roam freely develop a consciousness. Thus, animals have consciousness. I would add that art forms ritual, and ritual forms community. Most animals most likely feel pain in some form or another, even insects, which is necessary if you move through the world to survive. Pain, of course, is one of the primary sources for making art. Art is not, therefore, a result of human existence, um, of the survival of our art is yeah not a result of the um, of human existence of the survival of our species. It is right there at our birthplace. It is what distinguishes us from the Neanderthals or any other human species before us, and made us distinct. We became superior in, in, in interpreting the world, the cosmos, through art. We are able to give life a meaning and to form larger communities that make us stronger. The oldest musical instrument known to mankind is a flute made about 35,000 years ago out of bones of a vulture whose ancestors still roam our planet. Again, this is when our immediate human ancestors started to develop its distinctive evolutionary branch, and it is believed that the possession of these instruments gave them a strategic advantage over the Neanderthals. They could communicate via long distances without necessarily revealing their identity. 
The sound of the flute could mimic nature. Unfortunately, another story from Greek mythology implying that the nymph who fled in terror from a satire, turning into a reed and lamenting in the wind, becoming the first instrument, the flute, is uh, crumbling. A video by the American cubist artist duo Alora and Calcedia was recently presented at Castle Documenta uh, 13 that shows a vulture alongside a flutist playing the ancient 35,000 years old flute that was carved out of um, its ancestor's limb. Almost 40,000 years later that humans started playing music, I was appointed to become Luminato's artistic director. After the festival had been born seven years earlier out of a wonderful act of civilian courage and vision by David Pico and Tony Galliano, Luminato Festival is a 10-day international all-arts festival that happens each year in June, June 14th through the 23rd this year, that wants to bring the best to Toronto and the best from Toronto to the world in all artistic and creative disciplines. We do not believe in the distinction between high and low culture, but only between good and bad art. It's a place where artists can meet, where artists from all over the Canada and the world come together to create new ideas and share these experiences with the audiences. A large part of our works are commissioned by Luminato. To me, the idea of a presenting only festival is outdated. It is the old World Expo idea where countries showcase their culture. Stefan Herheim, a young German director, set Madame Butterfly in a World Expo setting. It took place in the Japanese pavilion, and the audience was witnessing a play about a concubine and her American lover. When she, when she decided at the end not to kill herself, but to overcome her grief, a visitor of the expo took out a knife and stabbed her. He wanted and he could not live without the cliché that this opera produces itself, a brilliant interpretation of the piece, and our voyeuristic and clichéd look at foreign cultures. It is probably a production that critics in North America would condemn as Euro trash, but it hit the nail on its head. Festivals today have to be motors of culture. They have to create a culture of coherence, a culture of surprise and wonder, a new way to look at the world. Tony Galliano and David Pico, the founders of Illuminato, knew that the arts can restore communities and help build Toronto as a city that is ready to overcome the SARS crisis and start its way to become a city of global importance. To me, the artistic community and the communities that we have to speak to are global, but global starts right at our front door. As Documenta 13, and this is just one of the random captions of, uh, of, of many of the, exhibit, um, of the pieces that were shown there, as Documenta 13 showed, by not including country of origins of the artists represented in its exhibition on the wall texts, artists do not have passports. They are global community builders and do not belong to one country. Nonetheless, they serve a local community and have to have roots in the local community from which they can grow to national and international importance. If you think about the work of some of the world's foremost artists, very often the individual or personal um, becomes universal. Cezanne painted fruit and a mountain that he could see from his house over and over again. Schubert's Winterreise is about one man walking through a scarcely populated lens landscape. Leonard Cohen describes the love of a night in Chelsea Hotel Number no. 2. Joni Mitchell could drink a case of you. Puccini's female herons all seem to follow a very similar pattern of sacrificing themselves for the love of the man, which often has a striking resemblances to Puccini's personal, quite tumultuous love life. An artist like Tracy Emin exhibiting her unmade bed, Douglas Gordon filming his thumb penetrating his other hand's fist, or Marina Abramovich turning her body into the work of art itself, Janet Cardiff's The Murder of Crows, all follow this tradition of expressing the deepest personal and making it universal. A great cultural nation depends on two things, in my opinion. Can it produce, build, support, and maintain great artists? And two, and almost more importantly, can it attract great artists to live and produce even temporarily in its country? Or in short, how attractive is it for artists as a place to live and produce? This is what made Paris in the late 19th and early 20th century the capital of the art world. Berlin in the 20s and somewhat today, New York in the 60s and 70s, Florence and Rome during the Renaissance, everyone came from all over the world to live and work there. Artists go where they can work, where they can create something new, where society, politicians, the audience are open to letting them experiment, where space is available, where they can learn from other fellow artists and will ultimately give back to the community more than they, have, more than they ever took. Affordable space is what I believe drive, drives most artists to places where they want to work. 
after manufacturing business moved out of Soho and the New York government allowed artists to live and work in factory spaces, everyone moved down there creating ex an explosion of the art scene. The opening of the Berlin Wall opened up an entire playground for artists to take over right in the center of the city as communist government wanted people to move into their new socialist building blocks on the outskirts of the city rather than stay in the center that was too much associated with Prussian values. In Paris, artists moved to older quarters that were deserted by the middle class, the Quartier Latin, Vichy. Artists are now moving to places like Hamilton or Detroit, where centrally located space has become available due to a social and economic shift. Artists like to be in the center of our cities, not so much on the outskirts. They gravitate towards the centers as they naturally form centers through their arts. Artists want to create their own vision of how they live and work and do not want developers to tell them how an artist's studio should look like. We cannot make artists part of our city development plan. We have to let the artists develop their own plans. Artists also go where other artists are. Artists need the dialogue. They are often their first audiences. Jasper Johns, Robert Rauschenberg, Merce Cunningham admired each other's work long before anyone else did. Warhol's factory was a close group of self-admiring artists that then managed to turn the act of self-glorification into a global product and, and create an environment of desire. Everyone wanted to be in that group, and by admiring their art and output, you would participate in the mystery of the factory. Watch where your artists go, follow them with your politics, your rules, your po uh, and be flexible. The smallest city become, can become the new Dessau, where the Bauhaus was created, Weimar, where the German classical age was formed, Nashville, the birth birthplace of American country music, Big Sur, where beat poetry was born, or Vancouver, one of the most important cities for visual arts in the world. Artists reveal and see what we're still blind for but they create what generations to come will remember us as and will make to their image. What remains of the past are its greatest artworks, the caves of Chauvet, the Egyptian pyramids, the Buddhas of Bamiyan that were destroyed in an act of violence against all human mankind, the forbidden city, the writing of Lao Tse, the Greek tragedies, the paintings of Emily Carr, the masks and carvings of the Inuit, the tales of the aboriginals of Australia, the songs of Leonard Cohen. The great American soprano, Jesse Norman, up there, sings the French Marseillaise at the 200th anniversary of the French Revolution in front of the Arc de Triomphe to an audience of millions. An Afro-American woman from Georgia singing at the holiest moment of French history. German choreographer Pina Bausch does not have to justify why there are only five German dancers in her company and 30 from Spain, South America, China, and Japan, and other parts of the world. Almost the entire group of seven went to Paris to study painting. A Hungarian immigrant, Billy Wilder, made some of the greatest Hollywood movies in history. A Danish architect built the Sydney Opera House. Most of the librarians of the ancient library of Alexandria in Egypt, which was under the Ptolemaic rule were Greek. Rubens was Dutch, but his style matured um, during his eight-year stay in Italy, where he found a community of artists that truly inspired him. Documenta 13 probably actually had more Canadian artists in it than Germans. It is their songs, their tales, their paintings, their dances, their movies that we listen to or see together. It's not Facebook that creates this kind of unity, as we do not gather around an idea, but more curveball around in virtual space. We can be uber-connected, but at the end of the day, we stay alone. Yes, Skype, Facebook, the stock market, Twitter are tools of connecting to each other, but they cannot be misunderstood as the centers of gravity around which we circulate to form our societies and share meaning. I could see a future, unfortunately, where the idea of nations is replaced by virtual networks and web programs. Already today, so many more people are more immediately affected by changes that Facebook makes to their user rules than any government laws could have on them. If we lose our artists and the ability to appreciate our art, we lose our humanness. Some of the greatest acts of diplomacy have a work of art at their heart. The Statue of Liberty, Liberty was a gift by the French. Jackie Kennedy got the Mona Lisa to be displayed in Washington when the relationship between France and the US was particularly strained. Wars were fought over works of art, palaces were looted, museums were raided. When the First World War fights wars today, when the first world fights wars today, it is not about territory or, or works of art anymore. It is about power and influence, non-tangible forms of value and resources, I guess. 
Some of the most important acts of diplomacy are spun around returning stolen works of art, but these acts of crime were also catalysts for global exchange and for communication. Bringing back works, works of art from Egypt or India is what opened a window into these cultures for Roman society, for example. Trade, of course, was another one, a more peaceful one, as was the World Expo idea, but somehow it, is, it still has the DNA of exploitation in it. Art theft, in most cases, which is interesting, is punished more severely as regular theft, which implies that society is hurt more by a stolen Matisse painting than by stolen gold bars. Often we tend to get rid of cultural works that we do not see the immediate value of. We have to be careful about what we destroy, as we are not necessarily fully aware of the inherent value of some of the works of art that we possess. We have to understand that we are only custodians of the object that surrounds us, both natural and man-made. In our Western understanding of the value of, of a work of art, it is actually illegal to destroy a work of art even though you own it. The idea of the work of art cannot be owned by anyone else but the artist himself or herself. Cities are very often too ready to tear down old buildings for the sake of the new without knowing what values that only become apparent in the future they might destroy. It is such a well-known story, thank you, um, it is such a well-known story and still surprising how little its meaning trickles down to how we treat artists or work of art today. Nobody valued Van Gogh's painting during his lifetime, and I would say nobody would doubt their incredible value to all of human mankind today. Artists are the only group who can turn something of no value or very little value into something of immense value to all people. Our economy works in a completely opposite way. It creates objects of value that are made for consumption that ultimately turn into the total decay of its value. A washing machine is meant to break down. Therefore, while our economy enables us to survive on an individual basis, the works of art let us prosper as a commu community of shared values. How much we value our artists shows how strong a culture we are. A festival is a meeting place of artists and the audience alike, a temporary home, a place with no borders, no walls, where artists can come together and create something new, something that gives back to the community, an exchange with, a, with its cities and its inhabitants, a global exchange of ideas. Most festivals today were founded over, after a major civil crisis to restore belief in the human condition and that culture paved the way of dialogue with other countries again. Edinburgh, Avignon, the Documenta, all after the second Second World War, the Singapore Arts Festival in 1977, just a few years after obtaining independence, and Luminato after SARS. Most older festivals follow the World Expo model, bringing art and theater from around the world in a showcase-like setting to a city. A little bit of Bunraku theater here, some French avant-garde play there, South American and Israeli dance here, Arab-African music fusion there. As I said to before, to me this is an old-fashioned model of a festival as it is only in the presenting mode. The festival that I imagine is in a creating mode. It invites artists from the local, national, and international communities to come together to work on new ideas. It bridges the gaps between the disciplines that institutions have tried to establish over a long time. For example, concert halls, concert halls have purged movement out of music where for centuries it was not imaginable for music listeners to also, um, to also not move or dance, which of course led the church to believe music was the devil. This kind of festival is a temporary home for artists of all kinds and backgrounds. It creates a temporary center for them to work together and it gives back to the community by energizing them, by interacting with them, by taking the city and its inhabitants into account and not, not just by putting precious eggs into the rich nests of the institutions around the world, but by actually creating something out of the midst of these communities and involving the audience in the creative process and making them experience their city in a different kind of light, transforming the way we experience our city, uncovering potential of its spaces and inhabitants. A festival is like a fifth season that comes and goes and has its own flavors, its own sense, its own temperature that you have to experience while it lasts as it is over faster than you think just like the cherry blossom season, the Indian summers, or the first fresh snow. It changes the way you see yourself and others and, relationship, um, and your relationship to your city. One of the most remarkable works of art that had a profound impact on the city where it was created was Christo's wrapping of the Reichstag in Berlin. Berlin was a city that has probably gone through the most radical historical changes, leaving many more wounds behind in any other, than in any other city in the world. 
It was not really, I was not really a big fan of Christo's work before, I have to say. I saw the pretty images of Pacific islands wrapped in pink fabric, although now, of course, that we know that a lot of these um, will most likely disappear, probably very poignant image, images. A river covered under big yellow fabric, and now this, a gray somewhat sparkling fabric thrown like a wrinkly tablecloth over one of the most brooding and massive buildings in Berlin, associated with the darkest chapter or better an entire volume of German history, the Nazi era. And then it happened. The building disappeared and the gray fabric was shimmering and dancing in the Prussian blue Berlin skies like a light cloud almost floating in the air, changing our relationship with this building, with our past, laying the groundwork for a transformed country, making Berlin possible as the capital of this new Germany that plays a constructive role in the building of Europe and the longest course of peace on that continent in its history. A new idea was ready to lift off. What had happened? Christo's fabric was like the magician's cloth behind which some magic happened, hidden to our eyes, but not to our imagination. It turned the Reichstag and the new Berlin Republic into a stage, being the curtain itself on which every person had a role to play, no matter where you came from or how long you stayed. What made this so compelling is that there was nothing to understand. There was only an emotion to be had, a reaction to this work of art. I want to try to encourage people at the festival to feel first and not to think. It is wrong trying to understand a work of art, a theater piece, a dance piece, before you have an emotional response. To me, the job of a critic is actually the most, the saddest job in the universe because you have to understand a work of art and write about it immediately after you see it because otherwise someone is going to beat you to the punch. Understanding may, may come much later, maybe never fully, I want people to trust their emotions again. Let me sum up the different points I'm trying to make. We cannot control the creation of art. We have to let the artist control that. We can prepare the space where it can happen by preserving space, not so much by building new space. We have to decontrol those spaces where it can happen. A great cultural nation depends on two things. Can it support and produce great artists? And can it also attract great artists from outside to live and work in its country? I guess the artist from the outside is the pig right now on this picture. Oops. Yes, the arts have an econ economic impact, but the, if that is really the only argument that the government and the economy understand to create space for art and support artists, we are at a very dangerous juncture. If we do not have any more stories to tell, if we do not have any more images or sculptures to contemplate, if we do not have any more plays to watch, music to listen to, we're not humans anymore. Art is the only product that can be consumed over and over again without being used up. Its consumption is intangible. It even gains more value the more it is consumed. It builds up more and more meaning with its level of consumption. No other product does that. Art consumes us rather than we consume art. It defines who we are. If we move away from this to mere event and entertainment industry that crea creates cultural products with a use-by date, we lose touch with our potential. Art is not a function of the human race. It is not an afterthought or a development of who we are. It is what gave birth to the possibility of our survival and the creation of larger communities and societies. It is what keeps us from falling into barbarianism only barbarians destroy art, or worse almost, do not create any. Christo's work of art created a new idea of a community, a peaceful, joyful dialogue that had not existed in Germany before. Just like the paintings of Chauvet gathered the earliest groups of humans and made them stronger as a group, gave them a sense of communi community and belonging together. To achieve these moments of meaningful community gathering is what my dream is of a festival. I believe there's really absolutely no difference culturally between what happened 40,000 years ago and what happened in Berlin early in the third millennium. The only difference is that at some point in history, money and permits entered the picture to regulate the exchange of goods to survive and unfortunately also attached itself to works of art and determines artists' ability 
to create works of art. But we must not confuse the difference of the nature of works of art and products of consumption. Here's what Wikipedia says about the origin of money, which I thought is particularly interesting, but I won't pursue this thought further. The use of barter-like methods may date back to at least 100,000 years ago, though there's no evidence of society or economy that re relied primarily on barter. Instead, non-monetary societies operated largely along the principles of gift economics and debt. I say, unfortunately, we have lost touch with the idea of gift econom economics, although the gift is a central idea to the arts. And Wikipedia continues, when barter did, in fact, occur, it was usually between either complete strangers or potential an enemies. So watch who you give your next $20 bill to. He or she is probably a complete stranger or an enemy. Thank you very much. <laughs>